Hello and welcome everybody here in the room and on the live stream to this press conference from the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos 2016. The question we are trying to answer with this press conference is, can Europe become a magnet for talent? And in order to answer that question, we are joined by an expert panel um, who are actually uh, spending every day of their life to, to answer that question and to make it happen. Let me quickly introduce the panel to you. Um, to my immediate left, we are joined by Helene Ray. She is Professor of Economics at the London Business School. And um, if you're watching on the live stream, you're doing the right thing because The Economist said she's an economist to watch. <laughs> so right in the center uh, of our plenary, uh, of our panel here is Carlos Moedas, the commission, uh, Commissioner for Research, Science and Innovation of the European Commission. And last but not least, we're joined by Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, the president of the European Research Council. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, let me jump right to you. Um, you're, uh, if, I, if I might put you on the spot, you're the man responsible uh, for, for Europe's attractiveness uh, for talent. Um, what's your perspective uh, uh, from Brussels? Um, how are we doing? Are we, are we doing the right things to attract, uh, to attract talent and to become a magnet? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for all being here. And um, I'm very happy, first of all, to be here with uh, Professor Bourguignon and uh, Professor Len Ray, because I think they are uh, really um, uh, the right examples that what we're doing is the right thing and that we have to keep investing in science and innovation and technology to get the world better and to be more productive, to create more companies and to create more jobs. And so I think that it's very interesting that this year Davos is talking as a mainstream subject the fourth industrial revolution. And that uh, it really means that the mainstream, uh, the heads of state, the heads of government, are interested of talking on these things that will change the world. And for the first time, you see this long-term view of where Europe should or should not be. And so I think that the European Research Council uh, is really our major and best asset to uh, get uh, talent to Europe and to actually put Europe uh, really at the forefront uh, of the fourth industrial revolution. So as part of the Big Horizon 2020, our program for research, science and innovation, the ERC funds uh, work of some of the most brilliant minds uh, in frontier research. People really that uh, have discovered uh, things that will change the future of our lives and uh, the welfare of our planet. Discoveries that will definitely fuel this fourth industrial revolution. Without a mechanism like the ERC, uh, I can't see how Europe could be at the forefront. So when I look at this, my first year uh, of the tenure of being a commissioner for research, science and innovation, the examples that come to my mind of people that I've met that are ERC grantees, some of them that are improving the indoor solar cells uh, or investigating biological forces behind cell division. And it's really by providing secured finding in the form really of grants that the ERC frees researchers from many concerns about the immediate impact of their work. And this is a point that I wanted to, to be very clear. I think the strength of Europe here is to give freedom to researchers, to tell the scientists, to tell the people that they are the ones who know. They are the ones who have to tell us what they want to do and not the other way around. And this bottom-up approach has been the key of the European Research Council. And that's good news for Europe because to advance really as a competitive global partner, we need the world's best to make Europe's their laboratory. So our objective is to attract talent, is really what do we need to make actually to put Europe as the destination of choice for the world's most groundbreaking scientists, researchers and innovators. And so that's why I'm so glad uh, to have to my right, Professor Ray uh, today. Because she's, she's going to tell a little bit about uh, her journey and why she chose to come back to Europe. And I've seen a lot of stories like Helen here that a lot of researchers, scientists that come to me and say, you know, I'm in Europe because the European Research Council exists. And so I really um, wanted to uh, basically have her story uh, about 
Why is she not in Europe? Because she had offers from all over the world. So over the past year, really, I've been uh, a very privileged person to meet uh, great researchers in Europe uh, with great ideas. And I've also had the opportunity to take part in the ERC's effort to make European research more open to international talent. As you know, one of my major priorities is to be open to the world. And the ERC is making it possible for more young international researchers to join research teams in Europe. I just, with Jean-Pierre, we went to Mexico, where we signed with the Mexican government to uh, be able to have more Mexican researchers here in Europe. So that's the priority. How can we be open to the world? Without openness, we cannot get the best research. I've made open to the world really one of these three pillars of my mandate because I really want the European research area to inspire the creation of what I call a global research area. You know, in Europe we've been for 15 years building this amazing European research area and now we have to look to east and west and see how we can actually with this example of getting together all countries in Europe to expand to uh, the other side of the world. And so uh, working at global level really requires a huge amount of openness. And that's openness that we are talking here today. This is why really uh, I've proposed the creation of a European Innovation Council that inspired me uh, really the work of the European Research Council because we need more innovators. But even here, the European Research Council is ahead of the curve because one of the things that we are here today and I'm happy to share with you today is that uh, Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, Professor Bourguignon will announce today almost 140 winners of our grants that are called the proof of concept. So how people are actually moving from fundamental research, creating products and innovation. And so that's a way for us to fund uh, that really translation of fundamental uh, creation to products uh, in the market. And so I hope that uh, these 100, almost 140 winners will be able to actually to make it and will be able to show that Europe is not just a beacon of knowledge, but is also a beacon of transforming knowledge into innovation. And now I hand over to President Bourguignon. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Moedas. Yes, um, I'm, of course, very honored to, to be the president of the European Research Council. It was a, it's a program uh, which was uh, founded by the European Commission in 2007, so it's still a young program, uh, but we have already uh, distributed, I mean, the European Research Council distributed uh, uh, about 6,000 contracts, so which really enabled uh, researchers to develop uh, their research at their complete initiative and that's a very important point, and uh, the ERC is really pressing the researchers to be as ambitious as possible. So we want really this, this um, support that is given by ERC to be really as flexible as possible, but completely at the initiative of researchers. The other point I want to make, which again concerning being a magnet, of course, uh, it's very important, particularly that young people feel comfortable about that. And so it's, uh, it was a decision of the Scientific Council, which is responsible for how one spends the money, which is a substantial amount of money. This year, 1.6 billion euro, which is put at dispo disposal of ERC. And it was a decision of the Scientific Council that two-thirds of this money should go to younger people. So I think it's a very important uh, decision because I think it shows that we are betting on the future and the younger generation. The point that uh, Commissioner Moedas uh, made, which is this announce announcement of today, indeed it was another initiative, the Scientific Council, to create for people who have already an ERC grant, a smaller grant, which is called Proof of Concept, in case researchers have seen along the way in doing their research an opportunity to really go to more industry things which are more connected to industry or societal challenges. And we want to help them to make the first steps in this direction. Of course, very often, this, that's the first step. You need to do many more steps. And actually, we're also discussing with uh, other people, uh, more business angels, to help uh, to make sure that the path goes all the way. So indeed, we, uh, the, the good news is that a uh, number of scientists who spontaneously, at their initiative, 
proposed to uh, submitted the proposal for a proof of concept was uh, something like uh, about uh, 300 of them uh, and uh, that's a very uh, starts to be a significant number because uh, every year we give 1000 contracts which so means uh, already quite a good number and um, it is uh, checked by very professional people who are people professional of development and then that's the way we get the 135 uh, na list of names that we are announced today. There will be a supplementary list uh, short, so we are talking about uh, 140, 160 people altogether. The last point I want to make uh, also in connection with uh, the, the role of the European <coughs> Research Council, uh, which is very, very important, of course, is that uh, it's, um, it has been recognized by the scientific community as a reference program. And from that point of view, it's uh, of course something uh, very, very important because for us, uh, one key element is who are the people selecting the laureates for, for the ERC. And it's only because it, it, we have been successful in uh, convincing the very best researchers to participate in the selection that actually we can really be uh, in this position that ERC has been recognized as, a, as really a stamp of quality. And it's true that for ERC, the only thing which matters is scientific quality of the project. There is no politics behind, it's just strict uh, scientific quality. So th this is where we stand. Concerning the openness to, to the world, one thing maybe I should stress again, because uh, here we are in the World Economic Forum, so we're talking about the world, is the fact that the people who, uh, ca who can apply to ERC can come from anywhere in the world, and they don't even have to leave their position. They can, the only obligation they have is to spend at least 50% of their time in, uh, in, in uh, relation, very direct relation with the U European institution. So in a sense, we are, not, uh, we are trying to attract people from everywhere in the world, and actually uh, this is happening. And we're also extending this by, uh, Commissioner Moedas mentioned this agreement with Mexico, but now ERC has a number of agreements with a number of countries to also make it possible for scientists from these countries to spend time in ERC teams. So also, that's another way we think will be to create the possibility for the magnet to function. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. Helen, uh, over to you. You are an uh, ERC grantee, so you, uh, you know the program well. And I'd actually like to ask you two questions. The first one, uh, if you could share some experiences uh, f uh, f from, f from, from your personal perspective there. And the second one, as an economist, um, what do you think, what's the, what's the business case, if you will, for, for doing this? So what's the, the economic case uh, and the potential for, for supporting research in Europe like that? Thank you. Thank you very much. So the first thing I would like to say is that citizens these days do not hear very many positive stories about Europe. Um, not so often we have these messages in the media. And this is a case where really this is a positive story. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really good to, uh, to be here and to discuss the ERC because I think uh, it's one of the, of the very big assets that the European Union has. Um, so I, I am a personal uh, beneficiary of, uh, of a European Research Council. Uh, when I teach my students, I always tell them that uh, when we are in advanced economies, the way to grow is through innovation, is through education, and all this relies on research, in particular fundamental research, but, but not only, also applied research. And this is really the way to, to actually to, to push the frontier of growth for advanced economies. We cannot rely on you know, mimicking other countries or, or investing a lot uh, as, uh, as we could do in early stages of, of, of the growth process. So it is very, very important to have uh, a lot of research being, being done since it's a public good. Uh, at least some of the financing has to be, has to be public uh, money. And there are very many positive externalities to that. So very many positive spillovers to society and, and simply to, to the economy uh, of Europe. Uh, now, personally, uh, so the ERC has been quite important in my career because I, I was based in the United States. I was actually a professor at Princeton University. And I was considering, uh, you know, moving back to Europe, or I, I had also some offers in, in California, in Berkeley and Stanford, and also in, in New York, in Colombia. And uh, when I was uh, considering moving back to Europe, I think uh, the uh, existence of the ERC was a kind of uh, tipping point that made me uh, really take Europe seriously. And, uh, and this is, in, in the end, what I, what I did. I moved back to Europe. So why is that? Because when you are, uh, I guess, a, a researcher, 
uh, you really want an open environment in which very high standards are, are set. So that requires, as was mentioned uh, by the commissioner and by Jean-Pierre, you know, not about no politics, no favoritism. It's about competing. It's about uh, transparency of the evaluation process. It's about having access to resources, and it's about flexibility. So freedom of doing really what you think um, is interesting and exciting, and, and this is how people, you know, I think, tend to be uh, to be m the most innovative. So, uh, in order to, to to get all these things going, you need an institution with uh, which functions well, and uh, and the ERC uh, is uh, is achieving, I think, a lot of those goals. Uh, now, um, so when I was in the U.S., I was focusing. Um, my work was a, a lot about the international monetary system and the role of the United States uh, at the middle of it. Uh, things like uh, exorbitant privilege of the US because of the, the dollar and all that. And moving back to Europe, so I've pursued this, uh, this type of, of research focusing on uh, the global financial cycle and uh, international monetary policy uh, spillovers. So how the US monetary policy uh, transmits itself cross borders to um, both advanced economies and emerging markets. And this is a topic which seems to be particularly relevant these days, uh, as, uh, as we are discussing uh, in particular here in Davos, but in, in, in many other contexts as well. So I'm very, very happy to contribute to the, to the debate, and so much so that I'm, I'm applying for another ERC grant. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elaine. It speaks to the power of the ERC grant that you choose the London rain over California sun. Um, we're, we're quite <coughs> advanced already in, in, in the time of this press conference, so let's not hesitate and open the floor for questions. Um, we have a microphone. If I can see a show of hands, um, uh, if there are any questions on the floor. Yes, there's a lady in the back there. If you could state your name and organization for the sake of our online audience, please. Thank you. Uh, titled a magnet for talent in Europe and these initiatives are good for a few people but how can they create opportunities uh, and jobs for all considering Europe's unemployment problem particularly youth unemployment in some countries thank you who wants to take a I, I, I can um, you know I, I think that um, we the only way we can go forward in Europe as a model is to uh, bet in innovation in science. And let me tell you why. Because we could go through actually uh, a model of having cheap salaries uh, or going into a model that actually creates value and goes, Europe goes up the ladder of quality and Europe goes up and can create companies that can create jobs for people. And so uh, the European Research Council for me is a little bit like the seeds, the creation of the seeds for that innovation. One day, we don't never know, uh, when you do fundamental research, you don't know if one day or not, but if you have those seeds, you have the ingredients to actually create that growth. And so I think that for uh, Europe, betting on excellence, betting on the best of the best, is essential for the model that we want to create, which is a, a model of creation of wealth, uh, and is a model of actually getting up the ladder of quality. And so that's, uh, that's a, a very, very good question. Uh, and it's uh, really why you see that a program like this has to be European, because you need scale. Uh, to actually create the best science. There's a, a, a small story that I normally uh, tell of uh, a man that actually uh, is a fantastic European astronaut, uh, Luca Parmitano, and he normally describes that. What do you like about Europe? Why do you think it's important that it's European science? And he said to me, oh, do you, kn do you know what's a tetrahedron? It's basically a pyramid for a simple language. You know, science is like that. If you want to go with the vertex up, if you go on up, the quality of science, you need to increase the base. So if without that, without that scale of 500 million, you cannot get better. And I think that's, that's really uh, uh, what uh, the message is today, is that you need European scale to do these uh, very good research. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Jean-Pierre, you want to add to that? Yeah, maybe I can add uh, a comment to that, which is, of course, the, the grant is given to, to actually researchers who make the proposal, but of course this money is basically for them to create a team. And actually, if you look at the, the number of people who are uh, actually supported by ERC, 
through the through through this uh, mechanism is actually more or less six times more than the figures I gave. So it's you already reach a number of like 36, 40,000 people who are actually supported have been or are supported by ERC. The second point I want to make very briefly is the fact that we are we just finished uh, a study. Uh, ex post study of some of the projects which are finished. So you know the projects are five years long so that the researcher can really develop the research uh, in the proper way. And then uh, some of them are finished, so we checked them. And uh, we had a completely external group to, to do that. And, and therefore, it's v it was very important for us to check whether the ambition we had that we, we would help produce breakthroughs had happened. And uh, the data are really quite fantastic. Actually, it was very, very good news. We will be um, give more details very soon. But uh, more, more something like 20% of the projects have been considered breakthroughs with very explicit, explicit description why it was considered breakthroughs. 50% were uh, considered extraordinary research, and 20% were considered okay research, and 4% failures. So I think uh, this result is, uh, for us, was very comforting because it, it gave uh, the really a very precise description of uh, how ERC has been really pushing people to their boundaries because 20% breakthroughs is actually much more than what we expected. We expected 7 or 8%. So I think uh, we are very serious about doing this evaluation on a regular basis. That was the first time it could be done because we had enough project finished. So I think uh, you, you are talking about uh, the tip, but I think uh, the tip is really pushing everybody up. Thanks. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any other questions? Yes, the gentleman over there. Hi, Alex Pickman from Agence France Presse. I, it's a bit, um, uh, bit of a broad question, but just linking, you know, trying to attract talent to Europe. Um, at the same time, we have this refugee crisis, which is also about, you know, is, is you know, Europe is attracting other types of people, but within that, within those refugees, within those people coming to Europe, there could be the talents of tomorrow. You know, the Steve Jobs uh, uh, example is used all the time. Um, I'm just wondering how. Yes how you see those two things linking and maybe um, you know to you I may ask a question to uh, first maybe uh, professor Ray but um, um, but also to you commissioner is you know in 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 the college at the Berlamont in Brussels how do those two ideas how, do, how when you talk to your colleagues how, how do those two uh, two ideas those two worlds meet so absolutely. So it's um, it, it, it's a very uh, I think important uh, point in time for for Europe. Um, I strongly believe that uh, there has to be a European response to the to the refugee flows. And uh, in, in a way, we uh, you know the, the numbers are, are such that we we really need to uh, to have a very well coordinated answer to what is going on. It is an opportunity, indeed. And uh, so what it means is that I think you, you need several things to happen. You need to, to invest in the integration of, uh, of these refugees. Uh, and uh, that's an upfront investment. You get the return on that investment down the road. Uh, but it's a very, very important investment to make uh, because, as you, as you say, some of these people undoubtedly are very talented. But even you know, I if this is not the case, uh, low skill mar capital, low, low skill market integration, <coughs> yeah, low skill integration in the labor market. Sorry, mm -hmm. uh, is a very important challenge uh, because uh, this is this is the way in the end that uh, the refugee will be part of society. Uh, labor market institutions have a very important role to play there, and um, so we have to to act uh, in a coordinated way to that to happen, and that involves resources. And I believe you know resources have to be European resources. Uh, in order for this process to happen in a as smooth way as possible. So we have a challenge in front of us, but uh, there are ways of making it work, and it's, it's about investing in human capital. No, I, I, I mean, I just um, to corroborate uh, what Professor Reis just said, uh, that, I mean, uh, we've been going so very, very, very difficult times, and so each one of us uh, in the college try to actually to help in the way we can. And so uh, we've just launched a couple of months ago a very interesting project that we call Science for Refugees. And so what we did was basically uh, through one of our website, the website that people look at uh, jobs in, in Europe for research, 
um, to actually put uh, a kind of a market making where we opened the channel in between refugees that uh, have um, uh, really degrees, university degrees that have, were in research centers or universities to get in contact with European universities. And let me tell you that I'm really proud of, uh, of what's been happening because the European universities respond immediately. And immediately uh, we got more than 100 universities that has, have actually ticked uh, on, on that website that are there to help and to get them in contact. And so uh, that's a little bit of how the community is helping, uh, the scientific community is helping. And so we are actually putting people in touch uh, in a very difficult time. And uh, of course, in, uh, really, when you look at the people, you look at people that were, some of them, working in universities and research centers in those countries. And so it's our duty to, to do uh, our share. Uh, but as uh, Professor Ray was saying, I think the most striking thing is that this is a European problem that needs European solutions and needs for all the countries to participate. The member states have to act and we have to actually be able to be united as Europe and give an European answer. But that is also uh, sometimes, really, you look at the member states and they have to act. They have to be, they are the ones uh, that are on the ground. And so uh, it's really one uh, really major piece of how Europe should work is that we should be together and we should look at it as a European problem with a European uh, solution. Thank you very much. Mindful of the time, um, we're closing the press conference here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure there's uh, time for questions maybe afterwards uh, bilaterally. Um, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for being here. And a special thank you to our panelists uh, for the fascinating insights. Uh, I think uh, we can be optimistic about the question we posed in the beginning, can Europe become a magnet for talent? Thank you. Thank you, everyone.